This is CBC Here and Now. Well, summer fishing season might just be about to get underway, but here at Aglulik Lodge in Labrador, they're still digging out. Summer may still feel far away in many parts of the province. But a fishing lodge in Labrador is still looking more like a winter wonderland. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Well, as summer fishing season gets underway in the province, a remote lodge is still digging its way out of winter. Igloo Lake Lodge has its first guests arriving this week. But as Here and Now's Jacob Barker shows us, don't expect to see any signs of spring. From the air, it's a serene scene. But on the ground, it's a hustle trying to get ready in time. How do you feel about shoveling snow in June? Second time in two years. <laughs> <laughs> Not fun, but we'll get it done. They have to dig out at the end of every winter here at the Glue Lake Lodge, but this year there's been a lot more snow and that means it's a lot more work. It's about a 40 minute flight from Happy Valley Goose Bay. Here, winter isn't such a distant memory. We've got the water lines that normally run under the snow. We can't find them, so we're running all the water lines to the lake on top of the snow. Broken trees, big snow banks, all that snow makes an already challenging set of logistics even more complicated. The steps were only just built uh, this week uh, so that we can be ready and make sure that it's safe. But snow or no snow, the first of the season's guests are already on their way. Preparation at the end of last season was key. We had a picture taken last year. We knew exactly where they were located. So we had to dig down uh, to the surface and um, extract the propane up so we can, we can use it uh, this week. Craig Gillingham and his brother recently bought the lodge. They got staff out a week early to grapple with the extra work. He's not worried about how the guests will react to the winter scene. It's all part of the isolated Labrador experience. I think the guests uh, guess would be excited with it actually and they'll say, you know, it's uh, something you don't get to see very often, this much snow in June. And while the shore may still be buried, the water is open and that's where the guests mainly want to be anyways, out on the water catching some big fish. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Igloo Lake Lodge. Well, I know the snow not be, might not be great, but a uh, glass half full, no bugs yet. <laughs> Certainly good news there. But uh, as far as the temperatures go across the island, uh, in the teens right now, and uh, a little cooler for St. John's, only reaching 9 degrees this afternoon. Those temperatures up uh, up through Nain and Hopedale in the single digits as well. Otherwise, we're sitting in those double-digit temperatures. If you take a look at the satellite right now, you can see plenty of cloud cover across the board. Some clear uh, clearing skies this afternoon through parts of Central in the west coast as well as the south coast and then if we look at that satellite and radar we are uh, seeing some showers down along uh, for the Buren Peninsula the Avalon Peninsula as well as we head through the night we're looking at some periods of rain with that tomorrow the rain drizzle and fog sticks around for some areas but we will see the sun peak out as well we'll have all the details coming up The city of St. John's recently passed bike plan has left some residents wondering what's going to happen to trails like this one. I'm Jeremy Eaton and I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. The RNC is warning the public about the release of a high-risk, violent sex offender. 59-year-old Dennis Murphy has been released from jail after completing a federal sentence at Dorchester Penitentiary for sex offenses against young girls. He's now living in paradise. Police say they have reasonable grounds to fear that Murphy will commit another violent sexual offense. His behavior has been described as predatory, often targeting girls under the age of 18 by supplying them with drugs and alcohol. He's under strict release conditions, which include staying away from any public park, swimming pool, daycare, school ground, or community center. A Mount Pearl man accused of fraud has had his bank accounts frozen. Philip Chancey is accused of cheating a company out of a million dollars. Now the pressure is on to return the money. 
Cox Automotive Canada believes its million dollars is now sitting in an Icelandic bank and it wants it back. The company says it wired the money to Chansey as a deposit for 744 cars, cars that never came. A judge in St. John's ordered his assets frozen. It's an order that applies worldwide. This is the second time in six months Chansey's had his accounts frozen. A judge in Nova Scotia granted the same order when and an American auction house made similar allegations against him. Well, a firefighter from Packet is getting international recognition this week. Jody Matthews is a National Fire Protection Association conference. She's there in Texas, and that organization is recognizing her as a rising star. Here and now's Garrett Berry has her story. I was a firefighter for 10 years but I was only on this department for um, to do secretarial work. I mean, I took the minutes, I made the phone calls. From secretary to chief, when her old boss stepped down, she stepped up. I think most of the firefighters were in shock, but none of them wanted to take on the workload of being chief. At first, I don't think I wanted to either, but um, I knew Colin's job. Started at the beginning. Absolutely no, no training, no skill work. Now, catching up. I've done my fire department manage, um, fire department operations and management training, uh, two-day SCBA, two-day fire inspectors training. With a little help from her dad. Oh boy. Who was sucked back in when she took over. Well, he's probably one of the ones who don't want to listen, but um, he do. I mean, he um, he knows the rules and regulations and what goes on in in the meeting room and on the training ground and. Oh, she got her own way. She got her own way when she was small, whatever now. You know, oh, she's all right. There are 13 sets of gear, and each of them belongs to a man. Matthews is the only woman in her fire department, but as chief, that's something else she's taking on. With all the female we have in the community, I can't convince one of them to join because, you know, this is a man's job. This, I'm not strong enough. I can't do this. I can't do that. And they don't understand, you know, whether it's a man's job or a woman's job, it's teamwork. She says everyone's on the same team, and her part is being recognized. Our, our, our ambition was to see a big fire truck and package, yeah, a bigger fire department. But you, it's not going to be probably as she dreamed of, but it can be much better than what we've had. This week's conference runs for four days with dozens of training sessions. I mean, I'm hoping that I'll be able to bring back um, a lot of information, a lot of knowledge um, to my fire department, to other uh, fire departments in other communities around Newfoundland. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Packet. The head of NOIA was in Ottawa today speaking out against a controversial environmental assessment bill. Charlene Johnson is asking the Senate and the federal government to amend Bill C-69. She says the bill hurts Newfoundland and Labrador's ability to compete in a global offshore industry. I think there's a difference, though, between environmentalists or industry and environmentalists and people that want to leave oil in the ground. And that's a lot of what is driving this bill. Uh, the Offshore Board in Newfoundland and Labrador sits on international panels to advance environment and safety. First and foremost, the environment has to be protected. But the environment and the economy have to go hand in hand. And it is certainly recognized through environmental assessments that it's not just about the biophysical. The impact on people and their social lives is very much part of the environmental assessment process. Now, Bill C-69 was also brought up in the House of Assembly today. The province is watching closely to see what becomes of the legislation. Here now is Katie Breen is in the newsroom tonight. So, Katie, what are the main issues here? Well, the province wants to make some changes to Bill C-69, but in order for that to happen, Ottawa may want to make some changes to the Atlantic Accord. Now, the Accord gives this province joint management over the offshore. Ball says he wouldn't want to do anything to hurt the integrity of that deal, but Crosby says the Accord just isn't something that should be messed with. 
will be resisting changes that would have a negative impact on Newfoundland and Labrador. And we will take all the necessary steps, all the steps that we have available to us to make sure that our rights under the Atlantic Accord are protected. I will not be voting, and our caucus will not be voting, to change the Atlantic Accord to take away rights that this province won very hard under Premier Peckford and has maintained ever since. Uh, this is a quasi-constitutional document and a manifesto for future prosperity and jobs for this province. As for NDP leader Allison Coffin, her support depends on just what those changes are, but she is taking issue with one of the things that the province wants from Bill C-69. Before companies can start a big project, they have to go through an environmental assessment panel. The province wants CNLOPB, the province's offshore regulator, to make up the bulk of that panel. Ball and Crosby feel the regulator isn't in a conflict. Ball says it's not CNLOPB's job to promote the industry, and Crosby says panel members can seek outside advice if necessary. But Coffin doesn't think the body is the right one to give the final environmental go-ahead. The CNLOPB is uh, certainly monitoring the, uh, the activities offshore, but at the same time, uh, their very livelihood uh, is built on them having more and more offshore activity. Uh, it would be a conflict of interest for them to, at the same time, be put in place a, a environmental monitoring system. So it's kind of hard to help uh, if your livelihood depends on having more offshore development. Bill C-69 is making its way through the Senate. Ball plans to wait for the legislation to the determine the province's next step. Live in the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. A plan to pave some St. John's trails isn't going over very well with some residents near Rennies River, Virginia River and Kelly's Brook. Council passed the bike master plan last week, but as Jeremy Eaton reports, one of the city's high profile runners wants council to consider its decision very carefully. Kate Baisley is often seen along the Rennies River Trail. If she's not running, she's outside with her three kids taking advantage of the scenic stroll. So we're on the trail every day. Um, we actually bought our house to be on the trail. Last week at City Hall, Council voted in the new Bike Master Plan. One of the recommendations is to widen trails like this one and pave them to make them accessible to all. Baisley, well, she doesn't think that's a good idea. I don't think it's very user-friendly for small children. They're also very twisty and turny, and I know even just running down them quickly sometimes when you come around a corner, you have to be really aware of, of children out, other people walking, so I can just see it being really hazardous. Baisley and others took to social media to voice their concerns about the possible widening and paving of the Rennies River Trail, Virginia River Trail, and Kelly's Brook Trails. The debate that we've been having is whether or not this is a good idea. There's a lot of strong rationale behind why we would widen paths and, and, and pave them with asphalt. Really what it has to do with is safety, ability to share, really get more and more types of users on there. Um, but these are all discussions, uh, while I understand and defend the rationale, very open to the discussions that will come before we begin putting any shovels in any ground. Lane says there is money set aside, but that's to look at Kelly's Brook first, a process that will be done with the community looking at it meter by meter. It's really a plan for how we can achieve that. So we haven't approved any budget spending today. Uh, we haven't approved any construction. Those uh, items would require engagement, decisions of council, and those are in the, really in the future. It's a long-term plan. Personally, I just love them. They're beautiful, they're soft surface. I asked my daughter what she thought as I was leaving the door, she just turned six, and she said, oh no, I don't think that's a good idea. And I said, well, why not? And she said, well, pavement's not nature. Baisley says she hopes that the city of St. John's thinks long and hard before making any major changes to trails like this one. Dave Lane's response to that is that anybody who has any concerns can voice them. Just head to the Engage St. John's website where you can have your say on what the city should do with trails like this one. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Well, now to some national news. There are reports that shots have been fired at a parade celebrating the Toronto Raptors' first NBA championship. Toronto police say a woman has been shot. Her condition is unknown at this time. Police say there is also a second victim. Deserving of the highest honor that this city can offer. Uh, this video is taken by CBC reporters and it shows people fleeing from Nathan Phillips Square at Toronto City Hall as the Tr Toronto Raptors were being given the key to the city. 
The incident happened as nearly 2 million people packed the streets of the city to celebrate the Toronto Raptors NBA championship win. The crowds were so deep, the victory parade crawled through the streets and arrived at Nathan Phillips Square well behind schedule. We'll have more from today's ongoing parade ahead on Here and Now. It's all about the Stanley Cup, isn't well, it? It is all about the Stanley Cup, and that bright, big, shiny cup is right behind us. It arrived earlier today. Hello, I'm Debbie Cooper, along with Carl Wells, with a special edition of Canada Now. We're live in Mount Pearl tonight. People are wondering, you know, these uh, legislative proposals came out in the summer. Probably not a whole lot of people listening at that time. You've given 75 days for consultations, and then you want legislation two months after that. What is the rush? Well, actually, I, I think you've, you've been very clear. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Here and Now. I'm Jonathan Crow, And I'm Debbie Cooper, live tonight from Mile One Center, where the St. John's Ice Caps are preparing for their first home game of the season. Congratulations, Debbie, on your early retirement. You have shared so many incredible stories with Newfoundland and Labradorians, so many historic moments, so many absurd moments, and everything in between. You are a great Canadian broadcaster, and dare I say, one of the most elegant broadcasters we have ever seen. Good luck on the next chapter. 
Oh, I like everything he said, especially when he said early retirement. <laughs> I've only been here 37 years. How sweet. That's so nice. That was lovely. Yeah. yeah. And you are one of the most elegant yep. broadcasters. True. I Thank like you that very much. Mm -hmm. nice okay, let's go to the weather. <laughs> All right. I guess that's what we'll do today. Be prepared for more of this, Debbie. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta find segues, better segues to get to, uh, get us to the weather. But uh, yeah, you went outside today, a little chilly. Yes, it uh, was. Yeah, yeah very it's, chilly. It's a little cold. It was uh, fog. A lot of fog, lot of fog in today. our area. Yeah, a lot of fog today. We uh, only reached a high near nine degrees. So we'll take a look at the the temperatures across the province. Uh, Twelve in Bonavista. Nineteen was the afternoon high in Cornerbrook, and then we've got those double digit temperatures through Labrador as well, except along the coast. Now uh, dropped a couple of degrees here. In in uh, St. John, 7 degrees, 6 in Bonavista. And we're still sitting at 18 degrees in Corner Brook, so uh, still nice and warm there. And if we take a look at the current satellite and radar, starting to see some shower activity along the west coast, southern uh, parts of the Buren, as well as the Avalon. And we're going to see that continue as we head through the night tonight as we stay unsettled. So there's those periods of rain that will move through. Still looking at fog and drizzle along the coastal portion, uh, at least the northeast coast and then the south coast as well. And then up through Labrador, still unsettled with that chance of showers moving through. And then eventually we'll see some clearing skies uh, for at least the south coast and the west coast as well. So here's a look at your temperatures tonight. Hovering between 6 and 9 degrees, could drop another degree for St. John's. Uh, winds between 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. So generally light winds as well along the west coast. And then St. Anthony looking at 5 degrees tonight. Now up through Labrador, heading down to about 2 degrees for Nain. So uh, just a couple more degrees for you tonight. Lab City sitting at 6 with those light winds. And then Happy Valley Goose Bay around 9 degrees as your overnight low. Generally uh, looking at that potential for showers right across the board. So into tomorrow, we still have that low pressure system sitting off the coast, which means the first half of the day will likely be RDF again along the northeast coast. And then periods of rain or at least showers develop into the afternoon. Mix of sun and cloud, it looks like for the most part along the west and south coast with that slight chance of a few showers. And then up through uh, Labrador, even or around central, essentially, we could hear a few rumbles of thunder in the mix there with some of this heavier uh, rain that moves through. And then we're gonna essentially continue to see this uh, up through Labrador into the evening hours. So going to stay unsettled, but those temperatures are going to recover slightly. Uh, certainly for St. John's should reach a high near 15 degrees tomorrow. And then we're looking at uh, temperatures in the double digits. Clarenville 18, 19 for Marystown with uh, that sunshine through the day. A little bit uh, further west, we're looking at that potential for some showers. Uh, Grand Falls, Windsor as well, you'll see some showers move through at times through the day. Uh, Twilling Gate, a little chilly, only reaching a high near 7. We can thank that onshore flow for that. And then 13 for Harbor Breton, 13 for Port of Basque as well. Stephenville, Corner Brook looks like it should reach, you should reach 20 degrees. And Gross Morn looking at 15 tomorrow afternoon. Up through the northern peninsula, between 9 and 12 degrees for the most part tomorrow. Those winds, again, generally light, somewhere between 10 to 15 uh, kilometers per hour. Cartwright should reach 14. And then uh, Lab City sitting at 12 degrees tomorrow with that periods of rain winds between 15 and 20 kilometers per hour. And then you're still looking at those single digits up through Nain and Makovic hovering around the eight degree mark. So you've likely seen them on social media, photos of icebergs swirled with brown and black streaks. So what's behind those fascinating patterns? Here's Memorial University professor Stephen Bruno. Hi, I am Stephen Bruno. I'm a professor at Memorial University of Newfoundland. I'm here to talk about icebergs. We do see blue streaks in icebergs and I'm often asked about those blue streaks. And this year we've seen a number of icebergs that also have these dark streaks, brown or black. And it's, it's safe to say that this is sediment or debris that's in the ice. Uh, and, and that sediment can, uh, can come from wind-blown dust from the surrounding mountains uh, on the coast of, of Greenland. Of course, most of our icebergs come from the west coast of Greenland. And uh, if there is a single dark streak within the ice mass, sometimes that, uh, that may have been precipitated from a volcanic eruption many years ago. But a few pictures that I've seen, one from Bonavista in particular, had many, many uh, streaks of, of brown sediment. And this, this surely was windblown dust. 
that uh, landed on the surface of the glacier prior to the iceberg calving off. That's so interesting. Yeah, it really the, the is. The chocolate swirl one was fascinating to see the picture from uh, Bonavista. So thanks to Stephen. Very cool. When we return, it's back to the streets of Toronto for more raptor mania and today's parade of millions. Welcome back to Here and Now. Calling it a misstep, Come From Away has cancelled plans to hold what was being deemed the world's largest screech-in. 
Murders Productions planned to screech in an entire come-from-away audience following one of its shows in Toronto. It was meant to be a nod to the unique culture of Newfoundland, but some took exception to having a screech in outside the province. The company quickly backed down and apologized, saying it heard the criticism loud and clear. So it's come up with a compromise. Four couples who attend a July performance in Toronto will win a trip to Gander for an official screech-in. Well, as the five-year project to replace underground pipes continues in downtown St. John's, the Big Dig continues to unearth interesting items. The latest find, a collection of 79 human teeth. Since construction started last year, archaeologist Blair Temple has been looking for anything that may be of historical interest. Discoveries so far include various bits of broken dinnerware, fragments of pipes, and an intact glass bottle. He says they found a broken egg cup that would have come from a building that predated the Great Fire. As for the teeth, Temple initially thought they had unearthed a body, but that was quickly ruled out once they started finding more and more teeth. Exactly where the teeth came from is still a mystery. Well, from downtown St. John's to downtown Toronto, where the city has opened its heart and its streets to the NBA champions. Up to two million people may have attended today's victory parade. The Raptors captured Canada's first NBA title last Thursday. Today, the players and their fans partied, and from what we can tell, they're still partying. As Simon Dingley reports, it was worth the wait. For many years, Toronto's been the butt of jokes, planning victory parades that rarely happened. This is great for the city. This is great for the country. Go Raptors! Go Raptors! The last time Toronto held a championship parade for a major team was 1993, when the Blue Jays won the World Series. No one's laughing now. Superstar Kawhi Leonard describes the turnout as crazy. It's amazing. Everybody's out. I don't believe nobody went into work today. The downtown streets jammed. So crowded, police had to stop people from entering the square at City Hall. This is why we wanted to win a championship. This is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And we ain't even close to being done. It's been 24 years since the Raptors entered the NBA. For many seasons, they were playoff losers, if they made the postseason at all. That's changed, says Montreal's Chris Boucher. As a Canadian, you know, you want to show, you want to represent, you want us to be champion. And... Worth the wait, say their supporters, like this man who says he drove here from Connecticut. It took me eight hours. I got here late last night, and then I woke up 5 a.m., come chill with the homies. You know, we really do have the best fans in the NBA, um, through thick and thin, the ups and downs. Um, they've stuck with us, you know, um, they've been fighting just like we've been fighting. They've been grinding just the way we've been grinding. The parade ran three hours late, but the crowd didn't mind, and the Prime Minister was among the team's biggest cheerleaders. World Champions! Raptors coach Nick Nurse summed up the celebration for Canada's only NBA team and its fans. I think it was Bono who said the world needs more Canada. The world just got it. Congratulations. Congratulations. Simon Dingley, CBC News, Toronto.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, today marks 100 years since an infamous ride in England, one that involved hundreds of Canadian soldiers. A British police officer was killed in that chaos. Now, no one was ever convicted for the killing, and that may have been because of a royal intervention. Thomas Degla has more on a story few Canadians know about. A century ago, Canadian troops were known to enjoy a pint at the Rifleman Pub in Epsom, England. Just what they were doing June 17, 1919, when a fight broke out and two soldiers were arrested. Very large Canadian convalescent camp. A hundred years later, that fateful night is being revisited on this tour, retracing the steps of those Canadians who were taken on foot to the nearby police station. They now have two Canadians under arrest. Much to the anger of their comrades. The First World War had been over for months, with Canadians unable to leave just yet. Men from both countries were getting on each other's nerves. There were 78 uh, women who actually left married Canadians. There was a lot of bad feeling in that respect, and the Canadians were wanting to go home and couldn't. 400 Canadian soldiers stormed the police station, which stood at this spot 100 years ago. They busted windows. They tried to set the building on fire, all in an attempt to free their comrades. Several police officers were injured, and that plaque marks the spot where Sergeant Thomas Green was killed. Four Canadians were sent to jail only briefly for rioting, including Cape Breton-born Private Alan McMaster. Years later, he confessed to killing Green but no one was ever convicted. McMaster said he'd been pardoned by Edward, Prince of Wales, who just happened to have a visit to Canada planned two months later. They couldn't even contemplate the thought of him touring those places if some Canadian soldiers were possibly going to be hung or sentenced to life in prison. Green's family held no ill will toward Canada. In fact, his two daughters married Canadians. His great-grandson was born and raised there. He would be in awe just to see that, that his family continued and remembered his service, that he, it's not forgotten. A story seldom told in Canada, still resonating here a hundred years on. Thomas Dagg with CBC News, Epsom, England. at the Muskrat Falls inquiry today. The men trying to get to the bottom of why the project is so far over budget and behind schedule expressed frustration today. Justice Richard Lamont listened as lawyers questioned a former senior finance official about how the cost of the project had risen by $300 million even before legal and financial documents were signed. Then Leblanc had questions of his own. Here's part of his exchange with Donna Brewer. So at the very least then, you were aware as the Deputy Minister of Finance that at the time of financial close, the project was $300 million over. At least 300 million. At least 300 million over. And as the minister's, as the minister's advisor, did you or anyone in your office think it might be prudent to go to the minister and say, Mr. Minister, this is a big increase in a very short period of time. We just sanctioned this in 2012. Maybe we better have another look at this, do some sort of analysis, do something other than just accept the fact that there's a $300 million increase at that stage. No, it, be, no, because I think as I indicated, even though I didn't, I can't recall exactly, I do recall the discussion of uh, that when you look at the total project costs, and you look at the cost to the taxpayer, that there was a, a significant benefit to the financing that was going to be achieved. Well, you have a $300 million increase yeah. in the cost. You can talk about the benefits until the cows come yeah. home. Yeah. You have a $300 million increase in the cost of your project. As a deputy minister, the people in the bureaucracy who are advising the minister, and I'm not saying this to put blame on you or anyone else. I'm just trying to, yep. it just seems to me to be an obvious point. Did somebody not think about, maybe we should have another look at this, maybe we should put the brakes on for a bit, figure out where this $300 million is, because you already told us you didn't have a breakdown of where it was. Mm -hmm. Like, 
To me, it just seems to be natural, like $300 million is a lot of money. Somebody had to take notice of this, and was there ever advice given to the minister or to the premier or anybody else that, hey, maybe we better just put the brakes on for a bit and just sort of just have another look at this? I, I don't believe so, and I don't think $300 million, even though it is a lot of money, in the context of uh, the sanctioning and the differential, I understand was 2.4 billion. I don't think that panic would have set in at that stage. And the, the direction was, uh, through the government, was to get this done. Turning now to national news, Quebec's new law banning religious symbols is facing its first challenge less than a day after being passed. Passage of Bill 21 legalizes discrimination. Bill 21 forces people to choose between their faith and their career. A Muslim advocacy group and Canadian Civil Liberties Association filed a motion in Quebec Superior Court asking that the law be struck down. The court challenge says it violates equality guaranteed by the Constitution. The province's majority government used a parliamentary mechanism called closure to push Bill 21 into law over the weekend. It bars public school teachers, police officers and other government workers in positions of authority from wearing religious symbols at work. Gloria Vanderbilt, an American fashion icon, painter and author, has died. Sweetheart, I was only 17. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Her son, CNN host Anderson Cooper, called her a remarkable mother and friend. Vanderbilt is known for the fashion empire she built around designer jeans. Her extraordinary life was in the public eye from the start. As an infant, she inherited millions from a family fortune. The tabloids chronicled an ugly battle over her custody that played out in court. Vanderbilt wrote about her life in a series of memoirs, publicly discussing tragic events, including the suicide of her other son. She was a painter, a model, and acted in TV shows and on Broadway. She had been suffering from advanced stomach cancer. Gloria Vanderbilt was 95.
Hi, Debbie. Uh, on behalf of all of us at, here at the RNC, I'd just like to wish you well in your retirement. Thank you for your service. Uh, on a personal note, I'd just like to say that our careers kind of started at the same time here. And uh, I know that you love this province and you love the people of this province. And I could, you know, from the interviews that you did with RNC officers over the years, I know you were, you know, at times when, uh, when you felt that we were probably not getting a fair shake, you were sympathetic to us. And at times when you thought that we could step up our game, you were quick to tell us. So thank you for that. Congratulations, Debbie. I'm sure you're looking forward to this new chapter in your life. I want to send a huge congratulations and also a huge thank you for all the support you've given me throughout my career. All the best. Okay, where are the tissues? <laughs> Gonna oh. the Kleenex for sure. We're going to oh. make you cry at one point this week. <laughs> that well, was so nice for the chief <laughs> and for Carl English to... Uh, I understand that you instigated these interviews. Well, <laughs> we've been busy. <laughs> very, very sweet. Thank you. And here's another one actually for you, a very special uh, message. Just roll this one. There's one interesting development in this case. Well, I don't think it took a journalistic Einstein, you know, to recognize that she had something special. The vast majority of the stocks are inside Canadian waters. When I look back, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of having uh, hired her and was, a, uh, and was one of the best moves that I ever made as an executive producer. Day one of this strike. Why is it so nasty? So and it was obvious to me, uh, you know, obvious to anybody, that she had the smarts. But th there were also intangibles about uh, Debbie. Okay, you're good to go? Good to go. She was, uh, you know, very likable and uh, very warm, and, and, and I trusted her immediately. And I knew that she would be grand to work with. You are now Olympic champions. Just how does that feel, Brad? Awesome. But I thought it was really important that the audience recognize that this person who was going to be in their living rooms every single night was a nice person, was a likable person, and someone that they could trust. And uh, I was absolutely right about that, if I do say so myself, because the audience did uh, just uh, immediately so took to Debbie. Good night. <laughs> oh my goodness, I really am on the cusp of uh, shedding a few tears. That's very, very special from Bob. And uh, uh, he was fantastic and a very big part of my career. Mm -hmm. Started it all, really. Yep. He hired you. Yep, yeah, he did. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, let's this, have a look at the weather. This is Monday, and we have to go to Friday. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's all very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, Friday is summer. Yes. Oh, so that's really? good. Yeah, Friday's finally summer. Uh, yeah. Is summer weather going to be with it? I don't know. We'll take a look at uh, we'll take a look at what the future tracker is saying. We'll start with uh, Wednesday. So we're going to still see that low spinning off uh, offshore there a little bit. So more potential for some RDF at least in the first half of the day. And then we're looking at uh, unsettled weather again through Labrador. We're going to stay with those cloudy periods uh, through the day. Temperatures, though, are going to bump up, which is good news. We're going to start to see those double-digit temperatures back to the teens for uh, St. John, 17 degrees. Heading towards central, a little warmer, 21 for Grand Falls, Windsor, 20 in Marystown, Port of Basque, a little cooler at 15 degrees. And then up through Happy Valley, Goose Bay, again, have that chance of showers in the mix. 16 degrees for you, 15 for Lab City, and then Cartwright still looking at that potential for some showers. A few peaks of sun as well, and 13 degrees up through Nain, still uh, going to hang on to those single-digit temperatures. So looking into Thursday, this does look like... It will be the best day as far as uh, some sunshine goes. We will start to see some cloud cover move in ahead of the next system, and that low will pull off. Uh, allowing for that uh, next system to roll in. More periods of rain, it looks like, up through Labrador. By the time Friday rolls around, that's when we're going to see the majority of the rain move in for the island, and it's going to continue through Saturday. And with this, we're going to see a drop in temperatures as well. So over the next couple of days, we'll hang on to these uh, warmer temperatures in the double digits, uh, as you can see here, and then drip, dip back down to the low teens. So 15 degrees tomorrow, recovering nicely with that chance of showers again tomorrow, some peaks of sun uh, into seven. We're looking at 17 degrees into Wednesday. Thursday should see some clearing skies starting the day with some uh, fog and some drizzle as well. 
And then Friday is the first day of summer, sitting around 15 degrees. That is a little bit uh, lower than what we should be seeing at this time of year. And then 12 degrees for your Saturday with periods of rain moving in. Now, central Newfoundland, 18 degrees tomorrow. A number of days in the 20s for midweek as we head towards Friday. It looks like 20 degrees as well. And then periods of rain on Saturday, temperature dipping to 10 degrees. And then for Western Newfoundland, similar temperatures between 19 and 21, essentially into Friday when that rain moves in. And then uh, we'll see that temperature dip as well for Saturday, sitting around 12 degrees. Now up through Eastern Labrador, again, still have that potential for uh, hearing a few rumbles of thunder tomorrow afternoon, especially for central portions, 17 degrees should be the afternoon high. And then we're going to fall as we head towards the weekend. So 11 on Friday, same for Saturday with periods of rain through the day. And then up through Western Lab or for Western Labrador, rather 12 degrees tomorrow, generally gray right through Thursday, Friday, a few peaks of sun. And then uh, for Saturday, we're looking at 17 degrees. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have a weather photo when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. Saturday was the largest single day track and field event in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Hundreds of school children came to St. John's to run, jump, and throw themselves into the sport. <laughs> yes, they hope uh, promoting physical activity in youth now will keep them active in the future. Here now's Jeremy Eaton has that for us. Here on Saturday, we are now hosting the largest single day event to be held in Canada. We have 866 athletes here today from grades three to grade six. And we're very excited to say we have 35 schools from across the province and it's uh, huge. We're growing more and more every year. We are now in our fifth year with TrackFest. Well, they're just little. They start at eight years old and they run up to 12. So it's their first experiences uh, getting into track and field as such. And uh, most of our children that start at this level are actually still traveling through track, fest, uh, track events in high school, which is great. Really fun. It was actually really fun. I was super excited. What's your favorite part about track fest? Ru the running. We have a lot of people here from the Avalon Peninsula. We have uh, teams that are in this year from the Clarenville area. We have some of our athletes are in from Cornerbrook uh, right through to Stephenville and Port-a-Port. -Port. So pretty much they're all over. Um, we don't have anybody represented here on this day from Labrador. So uh, we hope to continue to grow more schools. The only thing is when you get up past a thousand children in one event in one day, it's huge. I am doing long jump, relay, 150 meter and 50 meter. That sounds like a lot. Are you going to be tired when it's all over? I don't think so. The relay. Why do you like the relay so much? Because you're with a group of your friends and you get to pass the baton around. So far, it, it's soccer throw, but I, I like relays a lot. And it will certainly continue to grow because every year we have more student athletes as well as more schools attending. So yes, we will continue to grow it. At some point, you might see us outside in the parking lot, but hey, we'll make it work. Well, from one group of beginners to another, starting in September, just a few weeks before the federal election, some first-time home buyers will have access to a new program to help reduce their mortgage. The federal government originally announced it in the March budget, and today it offered more details. The CBC's Jacqueline Henson has more. Starting on September 2nd, 2019, this program will make it more affordable for young Canadians to buy their first home. The new program is essentially an interest-free loan. Canada's housing agency, CMHC, will kick in cash the equivalent of 5 or 10 percent of the value of a house. Young middle-class Canadians unfortunately feel priced out of much of the market in our large, vibrant and growing cities. But for prospective buyers in some of Canada's hottest housing markets, qualifying may be tough. The house price can't be more than about $560,000. The buyer's annual income must be below $120,000. And they need a down payment of at least 5%. Is this program meeting this goal of helping them saving more? Uh, yes, if you are eligible for this program. But in reality, I don't think that a lot of people will be eligible for this program. 
Still, the government expects up to 100,000 people will take them up on the offer. For those buyers who do, it could shave up to $300 off their monthly mortgage payment. They will have to pay CMHC back, either within 25 years or when they sell, and the amount will still be a percentage of the home's value. If it has gone up, the amount of money owed goes up, and if it's gone down, they'll owe less. And if the price goes down, then CMHC uh, also shares the, the loss involved in the price going down. A risk the government says it's willing oh, to wow. take, so more Canadians yeah. may have a better shot at buying their first home. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Mississauga. A little bit of a change in our weather photo, more of a nature photo today. There's no way you're going to be able to tell where this photo was taken, but I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you who sent it when we come back. In a tree? In no. a tree. <laughs> Welcome back. And once again, you've been sending us your pictures of when you met Debbie at uh, various moments throughout her career. Lots of times it was at open houses. So many yeah. people came through. But look at, and that is an open house. Yeah, Everett Butt sent this in. It was, uh, as you say, at CBC Open House in 2010. Wow. He says he had a great chat with you, Debbie. Yeah, they were always fun. <laughs> oh, oh, my. <laughs> yeah, so this one is much older. It comes from Nita Abbott. It was taken at the funeral of Joey Snow Smallwood in 1991. Wow. wow. Just before Christmas. He died around the time of his birthday. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Lovely. Flashback. And, uh, oh, we had, uh, oh, yes, that one that we just saw about uh, interviewing Prime Minister uh, Brian Mulroney outside the Basilica. Wow. So. That, that event is burned, seared in my memory. <laughs> that was uh, quite something. Historical moment. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Anyway, you have that lovely we picture. We do. We have another picture for you. This one uh, was taken in Lumpston, 
Lumsden. Lumsden. I can't <laughs> pronounce that. Uh, yeah, there you go. So it, uh, it was actually a robin's egg in a wood pile. So it wasn't even in a tree, Debbie. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but Emily sent us that photo. Uh, great shot there. A little bit different from the icebergs and the sunsets we've been seeing. So we love seeing that stuff. And if you want to share any of your weather or nature photos, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. We'd love to see them. Yeah, very, very nice. Thanks again, Emily. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. All right, that'll uh, do it for this Monday. Thanks for being with us, everyone, and have a great night. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night.